Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming to our fourth leader volunteer training of the year, and this should be our final one. I have been recording the last, this one, and the last volunteer training, and hope to be able to put those online on YouTube so that you can go back and watch them later, or if you missed one previously, you can go back and watch it. Our first presenter tonight is Tracy Polachek, and she'll be talking about reframing up. Hi everybody, my name is Tracy Polachek. I work for an agency called Catholic Social Services here in Rapid City. Um, I'm the director of a program called the Prosperity Initiative. Has anybody heard of the Prosperity Initiative? Going forward, okay, great, a couple people. Uh, this is a program that was started back in 2014 as a response to Donna Beagle coming here and speaking. Did anybody ever see Donna Beagle when she came? She is a, uh, a doctor who grew up in generational poverty and tells her story about how she overcome, how she overcame and her family overcame generational poverty to become a doctorate in education and she speaks out about barriers that people face in poverty so my program has three components and the first component is we are tasked with making Rapid City and the surrounding areas poverty informed so I go out I used to average about two to four presentations a month and now lately it's about five to seven a month um, we do all kinds of presentations but our biggest sellers are the one I'm going to show you tonight which is reframe up and our Poverty 101, which we customize to fit our audiences. The, this tells you st local statistics of people here in poverty, how many people, what the demographics are, what the systemic barriers they face, and what research says works to actually help get them out of poverty. Uh, second component of our program is we train and certify prosperity coaches. You are all welcome to become one. Um, we do this as an annual training once a year. It's a free training all day. We do research-based methods for helping people get out of poverty. We talk about direct service work. We talk about institutional programming. We bring in brain science. We talk about what innovative programs are doing and then as a prosperity coach you're invited to come to our monthly meetings we meet the second Monday of every month at 140 North Street which is the basement of Love Inc if you guys are familiar with Love Inc and we meet from 1130 to 1 and provide an awesome catered lunch because as you see tonight if you provide food people come to your meetings every month and we have a speaker brought in, somebody who's doing something innovative, somebody that's informing us about issues of people in poverty. We talk about research, we talk about cases. You also have the ability as a prosperity coach to refer into the third component of our program, which is our direct service work. We work directly with families and individuals struggling in the crisis of poverty right here. We use research-based intervention methods and we have a grant which provides discretionary funding. S research shows that if you give people resources or advice or case management it might help them through that current crisis but it does little to ultimately lift them out of poverty if you give them money it might help them get out of that current crisis but it ultimately will not do much to get them totally out and self-sufficient out of poverty but if you have a mindful marrying of the two and build relationships with people and have discretionary funding if it's related to goals we show we can actually help get people out of poverty so that's what we do in our direct service program um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about after 20 plus years in social work and mental as a mental health therapist as well I know about burnout I know you guys are volunteers right so we don't want you to burn out you guys have other careers you might be parents as well burnout is a huge thing in direct service obviously we work with complex human beings so we have complex human problems right and sometimes those things really take a toll on us so if you have giving hearts like your volunteers you're gonna be really susceptible to this and back in the day when I started in this field they said eat right exercise and get plenty of sleep to combat burnout and I'm like I don't even do that when I'm feeling fantastic like when I'm feeling terrible I really am not eating well I don't want to exercise research has come a long way in terms of burnout and so today what I'm going to show you is we're going to talk about burnout a little bit but we're going to I'm going to show you three different ways that research shows us that we can actually help keep fresh in this field um, another thing that I'm passionate about is reframing our difficult clients our difficult people that we're serving again people who often need help aren't the most likable people sometimes they're in crisis they're broken they're sad they're hurt they're upset they don't know if they can trust you and they probably shouldn't until you prove it to them and sometimes it's difficult and sometimes we help we help we help and we don't see what we perceive to be change with clients so that's frustrating to us and that can lead to burnout so I uh, 
I'm going to show you some ways that we use cognitive behavioral therapy to reframe our own thinking. This works with your mother-in-law. This works with your spouse. This works with your tough kids. This works with everybody. Um, a big thing that I promote is also our coworkers. Um, sometimes when you get in the helping fields, you have a lot of different people burning out at different levels and then interacting together and sometimes you have people that aren't real positive and it can really bring that whole atmosphere down. It's a big deal. It's a big deal in the way that we then go out and are supposed to serve other people. So today I'm going to start, um, please this is a very casual environment, ask questions. Um, I have a sign up sheet that's going around if, you, if you'll sign that for me. I'm going to use this definition of burnout. This is developed um, because I like this, these use of terms. It's a syndrome of emotional exhaustion. We've all been there, right? Everybody's been emotionally exhausted at some point. Depersonalization, this is a fancy counseling term, which basically means that when we get so, so burnt out, we actually step back and start to objectify people as a coping skill. We're like, I just can't get too connected to you because I'm really burnt out. So we begin to depersonalize people. And in fact, once we lose connection and relationship, we lose joy in our work. And it's a big symptom of burnout and a reduced sense of accomplishment. These are just symptoms, again, this is fancy, fancy counseling terms, affective, cognitive, physical, behavioral, motivational. Affective just means that you're gonna see this in your mood. Obviously, your mood is changing. Um, there are real changes in your brain if you spend a lot of time being stressed out. You will have short-term memory loss. You can have things happen where fuzzy thinking, foggy thinking, inability to concentrate, difficulty following through with tasks. These are real things that, that your brain is telling you stress chemicals are interacting and changing the shape of your brains and the path of neurons so this is a real thing physical um, when I was I started out in juvenile corrections way back in the day if you can imagine me like four foot eleven at the girls boot camp I weighed like 90 pounds trying to like physically restrain girls um, I soon realized this maybe wasn't the path for me um, after that that experience but then I moved on to work with victims of sexual trauma and and the stories that you hear the things that you hear over and over with Within the first three years of my employment after hearing horrible, horrible stories of physical and sexual abuse, I noticed I was sick all the time. I'd, I looked back at my medical records probably 10 years ago. I had like, I'm going to look back and see. I was in the ER in three years. I was in the emergency room four times with different things. I thought I was having a brain aneurysm one time because my neck muscles were so, so tense I couldn't move my neck and I was in such intense pain and those were all stress related things. My body was telling me, you are burning out out, you're not handling this well. I just didn't know it at the time. I thought I was sick all the time. Thought I was run down, just sick. Behavioral, you start seeing people not show up for work. You know who they are. Um, you start tensing as you're driving into work. Your shoulders get tense. You start dreading it as you're pulling into the parking lot. Those are physical symptoms of burnout. And again, you just lose motivation. The joy is, I mean, you don't want to volunteer because you guys have all, does everybody just have so much time on their hands they just don't know what to do with? I think if you're volunteering, you're doing this because you love people, you love the, the purpose. When you start losing that motivation and that joy, that's a big piece of why we do this. We wanna find meaning in our work and in our lives and in the things that we do. So what do we need to actually stay healthy? Young and Lambie did a study in 2007. This was actually a study of school counselors. Is anybody a school counselor? I always run into some sometimes. So school counselors are, have a unique um, experience in jobs in terms of burnout. They burn out at a very high rate. Does anybody know why that might be? Anyone? They try to fix it. They yeah, a lot of kids. They have a ton of kids on their caseload. I laugh because I, when I was going to school to get my master's in counseling, school counselors take the exact same master's training that mental health therapists do except for a couple extra classes. So they go through this training to be therapists, basically. And then you put them in a school, and the School Counseling Association, their board says to you, your ideal caseload is around 200 kids, but never expect that. That's what the board says to them. They usually have about six to 800 kids on their caseload. Um, the school counselor now with changes in education has to adapt so they, they think they're getting in this to help people and do all this stuff and really they're like administering tests. They're, they're going out and working at school functions so they have a lot of what you call role ambiguity. This is tough when you go into work and they say this is your job but really this is your job. You know. So this is a study they did and they found that the people who did not burn out and who did well in school counseling experienced a culture of wellness 
they had collaborative management where counselors had a say in policies so anytime that you're working with people whether it's volunteering or any kind of population if you as direct service volunteers have an opportunity to inform policy that makes you feel good and it's better for the system studies show right you have socially supportive environment that basically means that you have coworkers that aren't terrible people that's really important to us that we like the people that we're working with and we like our team we're going to talk more about social support later and the reduction of role stress again that role ambiguity and lastly that you have proper clinical supervision do you guys as volunteers have a team where you can go back and process some of the difficult things you're going to see or do do you have people that you trust that you can say you know I had a really tough case and this is what happened and you have somebody that you feel has knowledge and empathy that can say you know that was tough and let me help you with that that's a big deal in reducing our stress we're going to talk about these three ways. I'm going to teach you how to reframe up, redefine our successes, and renew yourself tonight. So the first one is reframe up. This is so, this is like one of my very favorite, favorite pictures. I felt like this a few times today at work. I don't know about you. I just felt like this a few times. I was dealing with our IT department. I got a little crazy. Um, so I know, who's IT? Somebody over here. Okay, I, I appreciate the IT. I actually married an electrical engineer, um, and I love how their brain works. But I like I'm like we ha he, they're like we can't get on the internet. It's a security risk. We can't let the client get on the internet. I'm like the client has to do the housing application online. So we have our two worlds are converging. So that's what I looked like earlier. No, I'm teasing. We actually have a pretty good relationship. So let's talk about venting. Venting is big. Um, venting is seen as very healthy. There's, I'm sorry, I won't just like stand right here and be like this now that you're sitting here. I'll stand back a little bit. Venting is seen as <laughs> very healthy. There's actually rooms in New York City where you can pay $100 to go into a room and smash everything in the room. There's like TVs, plates, <laughs> cups. I was like, what a cool business idea, right? Like if I could just set that up here, that would be so cool. So what do we know about venting? Um, I'm going to talk to you guys about, in 2002, there, if you want to Google something fun, you can Google the Bushman's Hot Sauce Study. Penn and Teller did a really funny skit about this and kind of covered it, but it's not appropriate to show at presentations because they use some funny language. But if you want to watch it, it's super funny. But in 2002, Bushman did a hot sauce study. And what they did was this. They took really high, strong graduate students. And they said, we're going to have your peers, other graduate students, grade your paper. And this paper is going to be worth a huge amount of your grade. So then being researchers, they, of course, took these high, strong students in. And they graded their papers. It wasn't their peers. And they gave them very terrible grades and very terrible feedback. And then they took half of these students and put them in one room and taught them how to vent their anger. They gave them the pillows. They gave them the smashing the objects. They taught them how to yell and give them every opportunity to vent their anger. And the other half, they told them the bad news and they let them sit, okay? Then they went into this, to both groups with an opportunity for revenge. They came in with the hottest hot sauce out there and a cup and they said, you can fill this cup up as high as you want and we will make the person who graded your paper drink it, okay? So what they, what they found was the group who had vented their anger over 78% of the time filled the cup over the halfway mark. The people who were left to sit in their anger and, and weren't allowed to vent, only 26% of the time did it ever even go to half. Then they did word tests with them, fill in the blank words, blank, A, blank, E, and so on. They took the group who were allowed to vent their anger, and what did they find? They found over 80% of the time, the fill in the blank words were violent, rape, attack, choke, kill, right? The group who was left to vent that didn't vent, didn't get a chance to vent, Again, only 33% of the time were those words even negative or violent. Most of the time they were neutral or positive. So what is that telling us about venting? It can actually be really destructive and that's what research is showing us. We all know that hothead, right? We know the person in our family, the person we work with, that the minute something happens, they are zero to 100 in two minutes, right? We know anger management. For years we used to send people to anger management. 
what we're finding now is if people are trained to vent their anger over time, you're, you will build neural pathways that will go there quickly, go there fast, and you will learn how to deal with everything in that manner. Where if you are taught how to use emotional regulation to calm your body down over and over, you'll develop those neural pathways. Your heart rate will actually come down quicker and you will be less angry over time. So we have to be very careful about venting, even in small amounts. And think about what we do, how we do this at work, right? We have a difficult client, we come in and say, oh my gosh, Mary, you should see this. Joe was in today and he was so rude to me and I'm so sick of him and I've helped him a million times. I just can't take it. And Mary says, oh, Joe, he was into me last week and you should have heard what he said to me and I'm so sick of it, right? What, have, what has happened here between us? We have a client that we're supposed to be serving, okay, in your capacity as a volunteer right? That I've come in, I've vented to Mary. I, there's one researcher who calls it sliming. I really like this term. I've slimed Mary with a bunch of green slime. Then she slimed me back. Then we're sitting here in a pile of slime and we're supposed to get ourselves ready with a smile on our face and go out and volunteer. Help people, right? But we've down spiraled, right? into negativity, both of us, and that doesn't help us. Because now my radar, my neurons are out for every client that's annoying, every person that's annoying, everybody that's bothering me, and I know Mary is my person. I don't even know what's your name, I should use your real name. Oh, Diane. Diane's my person. <laughs> Go ahead, blame <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to seek Diane out now when I want to complain about everything. And then that's sliming each other, right? So we down spiral. So instead of down spiraling into negativity, what we want to do is help each other spiral back up, okay? Because again, it's benefiting our brains. What happens to our brains if we're awash in stress chemicals all the time? Let me tell you. This comes out of my poverty training as well. What we're seeing with brain science now, people who grew up in the crisis of poverty were dying six to 10 years younger or earlier than people who grew up in the middle class. Why might that be? More negative. Yes. We used to say it's because they ate so bad. Look at their diet. People in poverty eat terrible. I'm like, didn't you have a corn dog for lunch, Susan? You know, like our diet is so great in the middle class. I mean, I don't even know what you guys have been eating, but since baseball season, I'm eating at the concession stand like every single night. Nachos, pretzels, you know what I mean? No, it's not their diet. It's that when your body is awash in stress chemicals, cortisol, adrenaline, those were made for us to do fight or flight responses that last 20 minutes at the most, 20 minutes at a time. When you grow up in poverty or in other crisis situations like being burned out all the time and you go to work constantly stressed out, you're pumping those stress chemicals through your body and they are wearing down your organs. They are predisposing you to diabetes, to cancer, to other things. You know all these people that are crazy? I'm keto, I'm organic, I'm whatever. I'm like, what, are, what kind of stress hormones are you pumping in your body? Keto Kelly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we're so concerned with some of that stuff, but we're not thinking about how we're taking care of our own thoughts and regulating our own bodies, which actually have a huge impact on the way that we go about in our health, in our internal organs, in the way that we, we live healthy. So this is what happens if we don't deal with this, right? So venting, we're gonna talk about reframing up. So what do we do to spiral up? So here's how you be a master reframe upper. You get the Slimer, me, coming into Diane, and I come in, oh my gosh, Joe is out there again. I can't stand Joe, I'm just gonna go blah, blah, blah. That's one way to do it. <laughs> you should hear some of these techniques that people actually do to not be involved in some of the office politics or whatever. People will go to great lengths to not do it, and some of them are really great. But here's one idea. So instead of that, I come in here and we're gonna encourage empathy for those we serve. So she's gonna be there for me, she's gonna think about my feelings, and she's gonna comfort me and kinda of calm me down, again, help my parasympathetic nurse, nerve system calm down. So she might start by saying something like, oh man, Joe is a tough one sometimes, huh? That's tough, isn't it? It's kind of a tough day. Yeah, I know, and then I'm kind of already like, see, she's taken the wind out of my sails. Then she's going to encourage empathy for Joe. So, so Diane, who's a master reframer, is gonna say, you know, Joe, he's been struggling a long time with his disability. He's so frustrated because he used to be healthy and now he, he, he is facing every year less and less mobility. It's, so, it's been so hard for him and it's really showing in his mood, isn't it? 
Okay, see what's happening? That's like defeating my sliming because it's kind of taking the wind out of my sails. So you're gonna encourage empathy for those you serve. Diane, I know you already know how to do this, right? Because words are important. Words, Let's, matter. words matter. Let's talk about words are important for a minute. I work with clients who struggle in the crisis of poverty, so they have crisis brains. Here's what happens when you grow up in generational poverty. You're constantly awash in stress chemicals, and as a kiddo, you are too. The kid, kids are there for every eviction, for every time that the school is called their house, every time that they don't have clean clothes and their mom is struggling and they don't have a ride and they're on the side of the road. Kids are struggling too. Changes the shape of their brain. God made our bodies so amazing that our brain adapts to our environment. So what happens is if we are in a crisis environment, a fight or flight environment where we have to constantly scan the environment for threats, the amygdala, the part of our brain responsible for that fight or flight actually becomes larger. The prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain responsible for long-term planning and thinking becomes smaller because we don't use that as much. So imagine when we're trying to work with people and we're trying to have these major long-term goals and we don't have things that are relevant to their life right now, how that impacts the way we serve, right? So imagine Joe struggling with a disability, struggling with whatever he is struggling with, and he's stress chemical brain, and she, she's talking about him with words that are uplifting. What's the difference between Joe, who is trying to get me to do something for him, because he's afraid to venture out. He's afraid to do things on his own and live with his new normal. What's the difference between Joe being manipulative or resourceful? What are the difference between those two words? Does he get the chance? To be resourceful? I didn't hear you. Is he getting the opportunity or the chance to be resourceful? Or he's always in the negative side where just day after day after day, something would be a positive change. Right, and what if you thought of Joe as manipulative and you were charged with helping him? I'd try to figure out how to manipulate, manipulate him back. You would probably think, you, wouldn't it be better for us to think about him as resourceful? That he's maybe doing the best he can with what he has and how would that change how we approach him? Words are important. How we describe people in our own thoughts change how we think, change how we feel, right? The secret of mental health therapy is people always want to change when they feel like changing, right? But the secret is it's the doing before the feelings change. For example, how many things did you guys get up today and do that you didn't feel like doing? I don't know, I didn't feel like getting out of bed, there's one. <laughs> I didn't feel like arguing with my five-year-old about socks, two, did that one too. You know, didn't feel like the IT argument I got into, three, you know, didn't feel like being kind. I mean, how many things do we do every single day that we don't feel like doing? We can actually do things without feeling them, right? So I don't have to feel particularly great about Joe to do pretty nice things with him or to say nice things, right? But it takes practice takes practice. So words are important. When I worked at Wavy many, many, many moons ago, I had a rule in my program that you were not allowed to say anything negative about the clients we serve. If I heard it out there, if I heard it anywhere, that was going to be something big. You can absolutely come to my office and talk to me about how tough your job is and what's going on with these clients and I will help you and I will encourage you. But imagine the devastation that this, these clients would feel broken, traumatized, everything else, and then they have somebody talking bad about them or accidentally hear a staff person talking bad about them. Words are important. And we begin to think about our clients in a different way. We begin to act in a different way toward them. And it does us good too because we're not pumping those stress chemicals over in our body, right? And changing our organs and changing our lives in a, health, in, a, in a bad way, right? So clear rules about who you say and what you say and who you're venting with. You going out and venting is actually robbing your coworkers of that supportive environment, which is important for you guys to not stay burn, to, to stay in healthy and not burn out. You want to end with solutions. So Diane might say to me, you know what, I know Joe's a tough one. I had him last week and I just had to remind myself several times that he is going through a tough period. You know what, why don't we do something nice for Joe? Why don't we write him a nice card? Why don't we say, Joe, you know what, I'm sorry about today. You seem to be having a bad day and I certainly didn't help. 
you begin to take that up to the positive is what Diane is going to try to do. She's gonna support me. Tracy, can I help you? Can I help you? Do you wanna take a break and can I do this? Or maybe this client or this person that you're volunteering with, and I don't know exactly your, your positions here, but sometimes people just trigger us, right? Sometimes they remind us of people in our lives that are tough to deal with, and sometimes it's not healthy for us to maybe put ourselves in that position over and over. So maybe we talk to our team and say, you know, is there somebody that would be better with this client so I can switch out? or take a break or do that. Again, we're, we're looking for solutions and we're gonna use scripts if necessary. I wanna talk to you guys about scripts. So as a therapist over the years and as a social worker over the years, I say some of the very same phrases over and over to clients, over and over. They don't know that I'm saying them to everybody and I actually mean them, that's the secret. You have to mean that when you say them. But having something meaningful in your back pocket to say in difficult situations or in encouraging situations is one of the best tools you can have as a direct service person. So if I had more time, and I can come back and do this with you guys sometime, I don't know how your, how your trainings run, but if I had more time, we'd do a script writing exercise, and this might be something for you guys to do on your own. But what you would do is think about a difficult client situation or volunteer situation, coworker situation, friend situation, in-law situation, I am not judging, and think about what a tough situation happened, and you know how hindsight is 2020, and you think, oh, I wish I would have said this, and it's usually something insulting that would have been really good to just nail them with. <laughs> Instead, take the time to sit down and say, what could I have said that would have reframed that up and encouraging or defused that situation? Take the time to write it out and actually have that in your brain for the next time that situation comes up again. You guys are gonna run into the same situations if you haven't already. Very similar things that kind of trigger you or I never know what to say when somebody asks me for money or when somebody does this or when somebody, I'm uncomfortable. That's a perfect script writing session. So until then, I'm gonna hand you out. These are just some of the phrases, nothing fancy that I use over the years so that you have these as a place to maybe start. So I'm just gonna give these to you right now. I'm going to tell a quick story here. Um, yep, sure. <laughs> um, again, it goes back to words are important. We're going to use it here. So I've kind of oh, gave you a quick overview of how to do this with somebody else. Now I'm going to give you a quick overview about how to do this with yourself when you become triggered by client situations or coworker situations or family situations. So this is another cognitive behavioral therapy technique. Cognitive behavioral therapy is very, very simple. It says this, if you change your thoughts, you change your, you change your behaviors, change your thoughts, change your feelings about the situation. That's basically what it is. So the first thing, I'm gonna give you a, a scenario. I've been doing this a very long time and so it doesn't happen to me as much as it used to because doing these techniques feel awkward and weird at first, but then as it exercise, once you build it like muscles, it becomes natural. I don't really know because I don't like to exercise, but I'm, I was to I'm told that that's what happens. <laughs> but men yeah, yeah, mentally, if you keep doing this, it will become easier and you'll be very fluid at doing it. So practicing is very important. But I don't get triggered very often, but I still, obviously we're human beings, we get triggered about things. So I, this happened to me at several months ago. I had a client who was living at the mission and he had four boys living with him at the mission. And if anybody's ever stayed at the mission, when you are a man, you don't have access to like an apartment and things like that. They, that's only for the women and children and only if there's room. So here he was a single dad with four kiddos under the age of 10. The youngest was five. They had been there for over five months and they are sleeping on the floor. It's the mission, you cannot stay there during the day. In the morning you eat breakfast, you have to leave. Maybe you guys know all this stuff, but it's not, it's not easy. You know, especially with school age kiddos, you, you have to figure this out. So he was so struggling and he'd been hooked up with a lot of um, other agencies and he finally gets around to me and somebody says, you gotta meet this guy, I think he'd be great for your program. I get in, into my office and I'm talking and you, I just could tell within five seconds that he was just done. He was done. And I'm trying all my rapport building stuff, my relationship building, and he's just really not into it. And he says, look, look, look. I met this doctor at a fundraiser the other night and I've already got a plan. I think if you talk to this doctor and tell and convince her, ask her if she could pay my rent for a year so I can go to school, I think that's how I'm gonna get out of the mission. And I was like, 
And I just instantly got really triggered. I thought, oh, I wish somebody would pay my rent for a year so I could go do something. That's where my brain went, you know? But that's not healthy for me, right? And that's gonna impact how I, how I take care of him. So I use my techniques. The first one is you have an emotional awareness. You have to tell yourself logically, and again, you're, you're kind of hacking your brain. You say, I'm getting triggered here. <laughs> Boy, I, that really triggered me, duh. And sometimes I imagine, I imagine a light switch on the front and I imagine it being tripped. If you do visual imaging in combination with logical talk, self-talk, you actually engage your brain at a certain point. So I try to do both. So I try to think of the light switch going up. Okay, that already starts calming my, my nervous system down. The second thing I did was imagine a stop sign. Stop those negative thoughts. I wish, who does he think he is coming in here? right stop just stop and believe me you don't think you can th stop your thoughts you can it just takes practice right remember how all the stuff you did today that you didn't feel like doing so you imagine a stop sign stop the thoughts and then you have to replace it with something else this is the thought replacement and again you don't have to believe this you just have to tell yourself this okay feelings are not facts I don't care how you feel I just care how you do initially right your feelings will change so you might want to say something to yourself about how could I build empathy for my for this client in my own brain so I said to myself this guy has been doing this for seven months he has four kids he's done he wants a shortcut he wants a shortcut out of this tough situation and that's all he's doing. This, this doesn't have anything to do with me. And then when I calm myself down, I wanna say something encouraging. So I looked at him and sometimes I use this phrase when I'm trying to buy some time to think of my next move. But I said, I just love how your brain works. That's a great phrase. Use it all the time when you think people are crazy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great phrase. Because you're not lying. You're like, I do. That's a crazy brain thing, and I love it. You're crazy. Okay. So, and I do. I love how his brain works. And then I say, you are the only person that's going to get you and your kiddos out of the mission, and you can do it. And I know that you want to try a shortcut, but I'm here to tell you, if you want to pursue that avenue, that's fine. I have a couple other ideas, but it's your choice. But ultimately, I believe you can get them out. You got to stick with it with what we're doing stick with a plan and, the, and you will get them out you know and you move forward knowing that I was triggered now that could have gone the other way too I could have been triggered and I could have done nothing about it and I could have let inside oh you want to help hey well I don't think that's possible you know it doesn't sound like maybe you're right for our program I could have said that right I could have documented it he just wasn't right for our program bad attitude nobody would have audited me nobody would have said I was wrong right but what, have ha what would have happened in my interaction with him people talk yes go back and go to I go to a meeting with my prosperity coaches representing over 80 agencies and I say you know what he's not ready he's not appropriate for our program he wants an easy way out what are the ramifications of that? What? The program doesn't work. One, I'm a terrible person if I can't work with somebody like that. No, I'm kidding. But haven't I done something, haven't I in a sense slimed him in a whole group of people that could potentially be there to help him? Haven't I done that in a way? Those kids will never get out. Yeah. You're, you're basically looking for setting a goal for him. Encouraging him to just overcome this thing has the potential to unlock all the things that we want to do in life. But stopping that because I'm annoyed with him at that point could have big ramifications, right? So we think, we don't think words are important. Words are important, right? Not just what we think and say, but what we say out in the community, what we say about other people. So that's the reframe up piece. I want to talk a little bit, and I'm kind of going quickly. This is a lot of um, material. This next piece um, has to do with thinking about the way that we define success in our work. I want you to throw out to me some of the most stressful things in your job, either as a volunteer in this capacity or maybe in your job, in your day job. Throw out stressful things that just really add stress to your plate. What management? In what way? Be more specific. <laughs> uh, you know, 
some of the management I work with, they just, it's like they have no clue what you're dealing with or what you're doing day after day. But they'll walk right in your office, yeah, I need this done. So like a disconnect, a disconnect from your day to day to what their expectations are, like a disconnect, I think I can relate to that. What else? Managing people. What? Managing people. Be more specific. What's stressful about managing people for you? Um, employees who may not be giving 100%. Oh, okay. People who aren't there, who aren't towing their weight, who aren't pulling their weight, who aren't taking care of business. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Anybody have a lot of paperwork? Paperwork is like my number one stress. Hor I mean, it's like I got into this to help people. I am not an accountant. Email. You know what I mean? What? Those emails fall into that same. Oh my gosh, the emails. Yes, paperwork is huge. Documentation, billing. Oh my lord. Anybody else? How people get along, like how children get along, like not knowing how to interact with each other. Okay. So other people's behaviors in situations, right? That's stressful. Right. Anything else? Normally I have a whiteboard and I write, write them down and I can usually fill about two of them with just my suggestions. But um, what about these things that we've just listed do you have absolute direct control over? Do you have control over what management does? You have influence, but do you have control? He did. I basically manage myself somewhat. As long as he sees things are getting done, he's happy. Okay, so you do have some influence. Do you have control over how motivated your coworkers are? Do you have control over how many people, how people interact? You know, sometimes we define our success like, I'm gonna go to work today and everybody's gonna get along and everybody's gonna meet their goals and it's gonna be amazing, right? And we, we define our success by things that we ultimately don't have total control over. We have influence, like you said. Our attitude can impact outcomes. The way we manage up people up in, in higher positions than us. The way that we interact with dysfunctional behavior can have an influence. But if you go to work every single day saying, I'm gonna define my success by factors I cannot control that will lead to burnout. If you go to work every day and say, I'm going to go to work today and be kind to the most unkind people. You have a lot of control over that, right? I used to work in a really toxic environment and I made a game out of it. I put like five rubber bands on one hand and then by the end of the day, my goal was to have the five rubber bands on my other hand and I would, by doing really crazy nice things in response to the total dysfunction that was there. And it was like a little game that I played with myself just to get through the day because everybody hated their job. It was horrible. Everybody complained all the time and I was like, this is a terrible environment and I have no control over this. So I would play a game with myself. You can do that. Nobody's stopping you. You can play games with yourself at work to make it more joyful and fun and exciting. But I defined my success by what I was going to do in response. Because I had control over that. I could leave every day and say, "Did I, I got interrupted a hundred times today, I didn't get my to-do list done, and if I would have defined myself by that to-do list, I would have felt like a failure every day because there's no way I could have gotten that whole thing done. I was interrupted all the time. So instead I said, did I do the best I could? Was I the kindest I could? Was I fair? Was I honest? Those are things that we can start to define our goals, our life, our relationships by because we have control over that. Does that make sense? So that's a bit about how we should be re redefining success for ourselves. In addition to this, you have influence like you were saying. You know that the management is gonna act like this, so now what do you do with that? Do you butt heads every single time? Do you, do you hate the snake for being a snake? No. You know? Figure out how to work around you. Right. Quit going to the ice box to get hot chocolate. You know what I'm saying? Quit going there going, gosh, I wish my boss was this way. But every, and every time he is, the same way he always is, I get freshly mad about it. That's insanity. Maybe have some acceptance about what you can control there and then decide how you're going to manage that, right? 
Work with them to define your roles, establish clear, measurable, and achievable goals for yourself. Today, I'm gonna do A, B, and C, and make sure they're clear, that they're measurable, and that they're achievable within that day. You, don't, you can't control your day totally, but there's certain things you can control to feel successful, right? And then again, the caseload is something we usually don't talk about here, but just work with them to figure that out. The last one here that I wanna talk about is renewing yourself. So, I, um, research shows that people who are in helping professions, volunteers, working day to day, caseloads, sometimes we work with people we don't see the end results of, their, of our efforts with them. Studies show that if we have hobbies, they should have a beginning, middle, and an end and be tangible. Things like gardening, cooking, where you can do something and use that different side of your brain that actually combats burnout, right? I wanna to talk to you guys about family, friends, and social support. What we're finding in research is saying that one of the best things for our mental health and our physical health and that actually counteracts stress hormones in our body is hanging out with people we like. But when you poll people and say, when's the last time and how much time did you hang out with people you liked? The responses are so low. You know how we're spending our time, right? We're spending our time with, at work, then we're spending our time, or school, then we're spending our time with family obligations, and let's face it, we don't always like our family, okay? That's not always building us up with really jolly great hormones that counteract stress hormones, right? We are always doing those obligations, and then we do church things, we do other things, and then at the very end we might get together with our friends. Raise your hand if you have a regular get together with your friends at least three times a month. Good for you guys. These guys are the healthiest people in here. I'm kidding. Study is showing that we don't get together with friends for several reasons. What, you know what, I think this poll is so funny. What's the number one reason that you don't invite friends over? Yes, it's your dang house. It's your dirty, nasty house. <laughs> your dirty house is keeping you awash in stress chemicals. Does that make any sense? That's so crazy. It's not like world peace or I'm curing cancer or anything like that. It's like dust on your floor. That's insane, right? Don't meet at the house. Do you know what it, right? <laughs> or, or take this advice. So you guys need to Google this and read this article. It's called Crappy Dinner Party. Okay, Crappy Dinner Party. <laughs> I read these research articles and I love research, but I always try to do what it says to see for my own self how it kind of plays out in my own life. So after reading the article Crappy Dinner Party, I said I'm gonna do this. This sounds really scary and I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna just see what happens so that I can talk about it in these presentations. So the cra idea behind the Crappy Dinner Party is you text your friends like 12 or 20 people, guys. Do not be scared of this number. You text 12 or 20 people on Wednesday and you say Crappy Dinner Party Party, my house Friday 630 bring whatever you have or bring nothing at all okay the rules are you cannot excessively clean your house you absolutely are not supposed to clean your house which was super frightening to me the second you cannot shop for that you have to dig around in your freezer in your and we all have food everyone is going to Sam's Club buying mountains of stuff that we don't need we have the food in our house get the food out of your pantry and make something spaghetti throw something together and do not stress about it and the first time you do this you will absolutely have a panic attack and you will have your friends over and you'll be like I can't clean the floor I did clean the bathroom because I have three people okay I cheated I cleaned the bathroom I will allow you to clean the bathroom <laughs> so all I had in my freezer I had a ton of ground beef and I I, I thought, what am I gonna do with this? I didn't, I thought, I don't have any enough buns to make anything, so I just made three different random things. I made like spaghetti, I had enough buns to make a little bit of this and something else, and I had no idea how many people were gonna show up. Some of my friends texted back and said, that sounds fun, blah, 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 and then other people, you know, I didn't know if they were coming and I was full of anxiety, and my floor was super dirty. And you know what happened? We had 15 people show up with their kids, people I have not seen in months, suddenly everything melted away. I don't even remember if we had enough food. People just brought stuff. Nobody cares about the food. If you run out of food, nobody will starve, number one. Kids ran around, we sat and visited. It was hours. It was the best time ever and when they left, my husband and I were both like, that was awesome. It was so awesome. And I would not have done that because I would have, weeks would have gone by and I would have said, oh, I don't have time to clean, I don't have time to cook, I'm so tired. 
record. And it was one of the most joyful things. And now we make a point to try to do it once a month at least. And it's fantastic. And now I'm less, again, the more you do, you conquer those fears, the more you train your brain to say, oh, that really didn't turn out as bad as you thought. So then you don't get as nervous about it every single time. So now I'm like, I would invite people over now. I would even invite you guys over now with a dirty bathroom. But you know, it, this is what's going to heal you. This is, it's your social support. It's your friends. It's, it's spending time with people you actually like and to hang out with that actually counteract stress, stress hormones. So crappy dinner party is important. The last one I'm going to mention here, and then I have an exercise to give you is personal therapy. As a therapist, I'm totally biased to personal therapy. And those of you who have never experienced, uh, had a good experience in therapy or had never had therapy, have, sometimes have the craziest ideas about what it's about. Like, oh my gosh, I have to go in there and tell a stranger about weird stuff and it's super uncomfortable or lay down and look at ink blots. I don't know what people think. It's just people think it's super weird. It's actually really cool if you get the right therapist that really clicks with your personality. It's your own private space. You go in, you say, you know, I'm thinking about that. There are, there are places in life nobody will ask you the things that a therapist will ask you. So you'll be sitting down at me. When's the last time somebody just looked at you and said, if money and time were no object, what would you do right now? And that you actually had time and space to think about that and respond to that. That's what therapy is about. It's about taking space and time to say, how do you feel about this? How do you really feel about this? You know, it's a cool place and it counteracts stress hormones. So that's another thing. We don't have time to do this today, but I want to give this to you and I want to give you guys a personal challenge. How many appointments have you made in the last month? Dentist, doctor, mammogram, colonoscopy, I don't know, okay? We have all kinds of appointments. I'm gonna challenge you to make an appointment with yourself and I want you to make this a regular thing. Set it up in your calendar, just like you would your dentist appointment, whatever, as a recurring thing. You can go to the coffee shop, give yourself at least an hour, go to the alehouse, I'm not judging, wherever you wanna go. Go there, take this worksheet with you, and I want you to do this worksheet. I want you to spend time actually thinking about, being intentional about the priorities that you have in your life because this is the other huge component that research shows. We do not take the time to be intentional about things that are very important to us in our busy lives and that causes stress, which then causes us to burn out. So I'm gonna hand this out and I wanna talk to you about this quickly here. I'll let you guys hand this out. This is called the Valued Living Questionnaire. What you do, and think about this. So on this side, you're gonna be asking yourself this question. You're gonna do the questionnaire first, and here's the question. Life component, how important, rate, rate these categories from not important at all to extremely important. And they're gonna ask you things like family. If I were to ask you right now, how important is family in your life, zero to 10? What kind of numbers would we be throwing out here? 10? Nine? Great. Now let me ask you this. When's the last time you did what you wanted with your family or family members that you've been wanting to spend time with? When's the last time you scheduled that? When's the last time you made that happen? <coughs> but you're telling me it's a 10. But is it a 10? because we must be doing. It's the doing that matters, right? Rate these things, and then on the back, I invite you to do the committed action to each one. And I don't want you to think huge, big, unachievable goals. That's not what we're talking. We're talking small, quality things. My intention was I really missed my oldest son. He's 10, he'll be 11 this summer, and I have three kids, so you know how it is. You get the one going, and then you have another one, and then you got another one, and by the time you look around, your oldest is like 10 years old, and you're like, I have not spent any time you and I miss you and so I really want to spend more time with them and I thought how can I do this I mean we have baseball we have this we have that we have swimming I mean what am I doing I'm crazy so I just made a committed action that a component of my life that I value is my relationship with my son so if I say I value that how do I back that up with action so my intention for this component is to spend more time with him weekly the committed actions that I'm willing to take include the following one, Institute Donut Saturdays. <laughs> Donut Saturdays, every Saturday we get up, him and I, early before the other two kids are up, we go down to Jerry's. 
he gets whatever he wants. It's a sugar fest. I get coffee. We sit. It's him and I for at least an hour. We bring donuts back for everybody else so they don't feel left out. But that's my time with him. And you know that like I hope he grows up and says, oh, I had donuts with my mom every Saturday. Because right now it's just so important to me. This very small one hour a week commitment is fulfilling my intention. And it doesn't have to be these huge things. It can be these 15 minutes. It can be I'm going to take my son fishing this summer. I'm going to sit down and lay out a bucket list. But I invite you to spend time investing in your beautiful, amazing lives. That's the best protection from burnout that you will ever have. And I hope you maybe want to use this as just a little bit of a tool to get those thoughts going. That's the end of my presentation today. Do you guys have any questions for me or comments or anything? I do. I have some cards. If you guys have questions, you can get in touch with me. And this is, again, my paperwork boom, but I do have an evaluation if you guys wouldn't mind filling this out really quickly um, and getting it back to me. Be really honest. I don't read them. I just stick them in my bag, and then they enter them in the computer. Does everybody oh, yeah. Sorry. Here. One, two, three. All right. You guys have some? Oh, I think they're coming around your way. I'll give you guys those. Did everybody and everybody do the sign-up sheet? I can email you my sign up sheet. You need to just double check. Oh yeah, thanks. You have my email, right? Yep. Well, Great. I'm emailing you back. Yeah, that's right. I'm like, Jay emailed me, and then I think you emailed me. So I had, so I have that really kind of. All right, thank you. And then I'll wait for those evals and let you. If you have to get going with the program, go ahead. I'll just click out of my oh, stuff you here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. I did eat already. Thanks. I. At, at McDonald's, not the concession stand this time, but ugh. in fact, my, my son's over there at the ball fields after here, so. Just over by? Just right over here at Rushmore, yeah. That's convenient. It is. I was like, oh, this is one of my presentations I can just run right over. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of this sound, I think the Catholics yeah. more like an exam at the end of the day. Or yes. That, uh, but it, there are these studies that have a stronger faith, whether it's Baptist or Catholic, yes. how they handle frustration that sort of thing? There are. Actually, there are studies. She, uh, Diane asked a question about uh, studies about people of faith. Like, if, if they have a regular spiritual component, does that protect them against burnout? Or It actually really does. And, and you can maybe guess why. Because if you have a spiritual connection, you have a purpose built into your work and your life, and it often acts as a barometer, and it acts as a place of processing. So like Catholics, she was saying, as a Catholic, we have an exam uh, an examination of conscience that we do to prepare for a sacrament and any time that you are practicing mindfulness that's a big buzzword in the community right now in the mental health field even though it's been around forever that's what people do there's just stuff that's always been around that gets new names I'm kind of realizing this but mindfulness anytime you actually have an intentionality of calming yourself reflecting and then acting instead of acting just reacting it's a coping mechanism for you that calms down your sympathetic nerve system. It releases all kinds of amazing chemicals that counter stress. Um, so prayer has been shown to do that. If people that are deep in prayer or meditation as a form of mindfulness can release amazing anti-stress chemicals into their body. Um, we, people who have a strong faith connection tend to burn out less often. Um, they tend to have that as a coping skill. Also, church communities tend to be supportive and positive for the most part, although I'm sure we have examples otherwise. But So there's that protective factor of stress too. Yes, for sure. There's some really cool studies about prayer if you ever get interested in Googling them. Um, have you guys seen it on Facebook? There's one that I just, did, I just watched where... There's two plants, have you seen this? And one, they played recordings of really negative things. Have you guys seen that? And then the other one, they say positive things too. That study is actually a variation on different studies that they've, they've done that on um, bacteria, praying over bacteria versus um, blasting it with negative um, sound and how, how that impacts those living organisms. So there's a lot of things that even we don't totally understand, but we know and feel 
um, you know, how you get good vibes, bad vibes. There's all kinds of things that impact us, but yeah. Oh, oh I'll take them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You guys can just set them face down right here if you wouldn't mind, and then I'll grab them all at once. Yeah. She works at our office. Yeah. They were at our house. Well, we had a kind of impromptu going away dinner or whatever with Father Brian. Yeah. Oh, I love her. She is so great. She keeps our office running like no other. Oh, that's great. That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Good. How are you? Thanks. Are you finding more and more of the kids? I had it written down at 6 30, so I thought it was early. This thing and not interacting with each other? Yes. <laughs> we have a whole. <laughs> I don't do the technology presentation, but we had a whole technology. Um, Holly Strand does a really good one. Have you guys ever had Holly come and talk to you guys about digital safety and stuff? She's so good. It's so crazy. Like, and although, to your point, um, with technology, we're now finding ways to make it work for us too. Um, a good example is if you guys are working with kiddos or clients, I think even teens, um, I just bought this to try because again, I, I read the research and then I want to try it. But has anybody heard of the Mightier, Mightier Game System? Um, it's, it's a research-based model, but it, it, you pay a fee and they send you a heart rate monitor, like a Fitbit type thing, and then you download the app either on a Kindle or an uh, iPhone or pr platform. And it is um, games that you choose, video games that you choose, but the only way you pass the game is you learn to control your heart rate. It's actually a biofeedback for emotional regulation. So kids start to learn that in order to make it through the game, I gotta calm my heart rate down. So they use deep breathing and emotional regulation to make it through the game. And the, the results are astounding in terms of behavior modification. They've noticed 60% um, reduction parents report um, and classrooms, 60% reduction in outbursts, 40% um, reduction in negative talk thinking. Um, they also, it's, they're pretty smart with this. You pay this subscription fee, so two times a month, a licensed social worker or psychologist will call you as a parent or a volunteer or caregiver and do sessions with you so that you can reinforce what the kids are learning. You learn like the language and you learn like this. So as technology is robbing us, I have hope that there are some things that are coming out of, and I was also heartened by some of the video game studies that are showing that as much as we in our generation think it's so scary to see kids in front of screens all the time, there is a big difference between what they're doing on screens and how valuable that can be, and, and the research is starting to bear that out. So games like Minecraft, um, games where there's building logic, planning, those kind of things do have some really good impacts on mental function, where games that, um, Violent games, again, we're showing those, you know, my, and my kids aren't allowed to do that. Um, but predators are getting pretty savvy with that too. They're getting into those innocent looking games as chat people, and then the, the chat is where grooming is happening and stuff. So yeah, Holly would be wonderful to come and talk to you guys about. I know you guys have a meeting. I could talk all day, but yes, yes. So I should let you guys, but thank you guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh.